Hello and welcome back. OK, in the last video we did some hardware scrolling and that was very much a case of manipulating the pre-initialization values for the counters we already had that were addressing memory and that allowed us to do some pretty cool stuff in terms of appearing to move the whole contents of the screen around nice and quickly. Now the title of this video is Beam Racing and that term is a slightly fuzzy term that applies to a whole range of techniques and systems used by game developers and demo coders to create more interesting visual effects. So the term comes from the way in a cathode ray tube display the electron beam physically traces across the visible portion of the image. And beam racing is the practice of tracking where we believe that beam to currently be and changing properties about the display hardware in order to produce a result on screen that we couldn't do with static state of the video hardware. The main piece of state beyond the frame buffer we've got is the scrolling hardware we added in the last video. So let's see what we can do by updating that. OK, so here's our uh, common parrot test image. So I've written the most basic program I can think of to start talking about these effects. And so I'm going to run that for you. OK, so what this is doing is it tracks the current location of the scan line and it sets the horizontal scroll register to a different value for each scan line. The value it uses comes from a sine wave table and I just kind of scroll through that. So down here we can see that that uh, horizontal scroll value is changing fairly frequently over the course of a frame. And this is actually a kind of a cool effect. It's certainly something that we couldn't achieve by updating the contents of the frame buffer. We'd have to update the entire screen, which we don't have the speed to do. But I'm also kind of manipulating it at a sub-pixel level compared to what I've got in the frame buffer, and that gives us a fast mover effect. So after this proof of concept, I sat there and thought, well, what could I do that would um, really be a bit more impressive to maximize the use of the horizontal scroll register? And what I came up with was this. So this is supposed to be a little bit of clouds, some background mountains, and a kind of random dot plane in the foreground that's scrolling past with essentially a 3D parallax effect. What you should note though is that this is essentially trickery. There isn't any multiple layers of scrolling going on. This is simply different rate scrolling between this top quarter, the next quarter, and then I'm changing the scrolling rate for every scan line below that. Now, one thing people realized quite early when making kind of parallax effects like this is if you approximate the actual speed change for different depths, it looks a bit more realistic. So I spent the time to do that, although there are some nice shortcuts to it. But I'm hoping what you see from this is quite a nice 3D effect. And we haven't added any hardware to the processor to do this. It's actually a fairly straightforward and not that much different code from that much simpler screen wibble effect we saw in the last demo. So here you can see what the static image actually looks like when I stop the processor. What we've got here is simply the clouds on one level and I made sure that they didn't overlap with the mountains, then the mountains and then essentially a, a slightly blurred random dot field at the bottom that's going to form the terrain. Now it's worth mentioning that the formation of the image in the second VJ video could actually be thought of as beam racing. There the only thing we had to change in the video hardware was the color register which we treated kind of as if it was a single byte color buffer for the entire image and then we beam raced to change the pixels and create a, an actual two-dimensional image. Now everything we've done here is just changing the horizontal scroll register. But it would be very interesting if we could change the vertical scroll register, but that's not going to do anything. Now we've demonstrated vertical scrolling, and that's the register here, but these counters only load the value of that register on the vertical sync pulse. So many years ago, when I first did some experimentation with beam racing techniques like this using scrolling hardware, I was able to change the horizontal scroll register and I came up with some clever ideas of things I could do changing the vertical scrolling and the hardware didn't support it. 
Same problem we've got here, but we're building this ourselves so we can change that. So I sat about and thought, what would be the simplest modification I could make to this hardware to make beam race effects based on the vertical scrolling control possible? So let's do that. Right, so quick recap. We've got the horizontal scroll values held in these two registers. And then the 163 counters will read that in once per frame on the vertical sync. So what I'd like to do is have it so the value in these counters is read in once per frame or when we actually write it. So the 163 counters are clocked once per scan line in order to increment the Y position. So what I want is when we actually update these registers, we want to be able to set the parallel load line, but we need to remember that for the start of the next scan line so we can actually read the data in. So we're going to need a little bit of state, so I'm going to use a set reset latch, and I'm going to build that from a 74LS00. Right, so that's power and ground. So I'm going to use the top two gates to form the set reset latch. So firstly, we connect the output of one to the input of the next, and then we connect back that output to one of the inputs of the first one. All right, so the action of the latch is very simple. We're going to set it when we write to the upper portion of this horizontal scroll register. because so we're always going to be writing to the low portion, then the upper portion, and when the upper portion's read, then it's all been set. And then we're going to reset it on our vertical sync. So the output from the set reset latch could be used to directly drive the parallel load line, and that would get the effect we wanted on the horizontal load, but it's not going to get the continued operation when we're not actively writing to this register. So what we need to do is take that output and and it with the regular tick we were applying based on the vertical sync. Now we don't actually have an AND gate, but I can use one of these NAND gates and the final unused NAND gate as an inverter to give us the AND operation. Right, so firstly, I will take that vertical sync input as one of the inputs to our AND gate, and then output from the set reset latch is the other input. Then I will take the output from there into one of the inputs of the remaining NAND gate and the other input so we can use it as an inverter. So then the output of that is the final drive for our parallel load. Okay, let's check to see if this works because if it does, I think we're gonna be able to do some really cool things. Okay, so as a first test, what I've done is I've just taken the Wibble program I wrote before and I've changed it to modify the vertical scroll parameter. Okay, so the parrot's upside down because I used the vertical scanline counter that counts downwards just to simplify the code and then I offset the sign lookup value. In some ways, this kind of looks less interesting to me than the horizontal scrolling version, but this is really just a proof test to see that we can actually modify that register stably over the course of a frame. And I'm kind of excited about the kind of stuff that we're going to be able to do if we use this functionality. So let's write something cooler. Right, let's take a look at this one. That's awesome. Okay, so in the background, we've got our regular little parrot image that we're using as test data, but hopefully what you're seeing is this kind of three-dimensional cylinder rolling backwards and forwards on top. Now, the motion of this cylinder is actually keyed off exactly the same sine wave table that um, I used in the previous Wibble demo but I've added an additional pre-calculation table which gives me the projected offset looking down on a cylinder. And that allows me to create this effect that feels very much 3D. Now the big benefit is I'm not limited by these big chunky eight by eight pixels. So you can see the pixels as they exist here are kind of shrinking and 
enlarging as they move across the surface of this cylinder. But this is a really cool effect. The actual complexity of the code that's doing this is virtually the same as that last basic program I showed you. So this is a really good demonstration of basic beam racing. Of course, where it's going to get really interesting is combining horizontal and vertical displacement of the scrolling values. So let's have a play around with what we can do with that. Okay, let's try a first test. Okay, so this is a little candle flame. And this effect is very, very simple. All I've actually got is a combination of the horizontal wibble and the vertical wibble demos running at the same time. But I've offset the timing of them ever so slightly at different rates. So in theory, the kind of the loop period of this effect is much longer. Now, when I was thinking about this video topic, this was one of the effects I was really keen to do, even though visually it's quite simple. Because this kind of out of sync distortions is actually one of the fundamental building blocks that graphics programmers use to build up more complicated effects. So this is actually kind of in the digital DNA of a whole bunch of effects I've done over the years on various platforms and various video systems, all the way up to the latest next-gen games consoles. So the base image here when we stop the processor is just a single candle flame as a, as a background image. And then all of the animation purely comes from modifying those horizontal and vertical scroll values. Of course, you could see from that side scrolling demo we did earlier that you can do an awful lot more with this kind of effect. It really just kind of depends how much time and effort you put into the programming and the generation of your data. So I have done one more demo, which is hopefully just going to give a little bit more of a look at the potential of this kind of technique when you spend the time and the effort to uh, implement it. Ha! Ah. Okay, so just remember this is running on a very basic breadboard VGA TTL adapter written on a homebrew TTL CPU. So what I'm doing here is obviously attempting to simulate driving around a bit of a racetrack. Now, some of this stuff up the top you'll recognize from the earlier scrolling demo but I kind of compressed the mountains down a little bit. Let's stop that so you can see what I'm actually doing. So you can see the clouds and the mountains here, but then I've got these two sections of track, which I've edited to have a white line and yellow edges on one, and just red edges on the other. And what I'm doing here is stretching out this quarter of the screen to fill the bottom half of the screen and then carefully alternating between the two using the vertical scrolling control whilst using the horizontal scrolling control in order to create the sense of the track um, moving left to right and curving. Sometimes when you see effects like this being done it's uh, fun to think about what the underlying contents of the frame buffer is to achieve the effect that you're seeing on screen. Okay, so these demos did take a bit of time to code, but I'm hoping you appreciate that this was quite a fun time to stop and uh, take a little break and see what we can do with the hardware that's been built so far. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed these demos. I certainly enjoyed coding them and uh, getting to experiment with what this hardware can actually do now. I'm going to change direction a little bit on the VGA build because I'm running out of space on the board here without... Um, Kind of zooming out the camera further than I can productively show you what's going on. And so what I'm going to do is look at taking the circuitry we've built so far and turning that into PCBs. So I'm going to start with the sync generation circuit, the counters and the feedback to the, the CPU, as well as the basic frame buffer circuitry. And that's quite interesting because the frame buffer circuitry has an awful lot in common with the tile map 
and the sprite circuitry. And so it's going to be quite handy if we turn that into PCBs, free up the breadboards, and then we can utilize the, the circuit as we've currently got and just talk about the differences in the circuit. And so that's going to allow us to move through some of those more complicated bits of componentry reasonably quickly without spending an awful lot of time uh, retreading the existing work. One thing I think that's fun with this kind of system is looking at what other people have done and trying to kind of decode the way they've done it, what's the contents of the frame buffer and what they're doing to the registers to get an effect. So I've got one more demo which I'm not going to show you the working of, just so you can look at it and, uh, and maybe uh, have a little bit of that fun working out what I've done. Okay, this one's quite fun, but a bit more of a demo coder thing than a game programmer thing. So what I was attempting to do here was create the look of a, a double helix with some colorful sections. So have a think about what you think I'm doing here and what the frame buffer looks like, and uh, maybe comment or uh, discuss it in the Discord. Okay, well, I hope you found this all interesting. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you again soon. Goodbye.